<clears throat> it's time for episode 23 of The Crisis Show here on YouTube and Google Hangouts On Air, now seen in 93 countries. Tonight, a ferry accident in Manhattan, Allstate Insurance and its Sandy fiasco, and Cinemark USA's invite to families of the Aurora, Colorado movie theater uh, shooting victims. My name is Rich Klein. I'm the host of the show and president of Law Firms PR and Rich Social Media, coming to you tonight from Sullivan County, New York in the Catskills. And with me to analyze these events and much more is my guest, Brad Phillips. How are you, Brad? Nice to see you again. Hi, Rich. Good to be with you again. Good. So let me just uh, introduce Brad. For those of you who don't know them, don't know Brad, but uh, you will know him if you don't uh, after the show. Uh, Brad is known uh, as Mr. Media Training. That's uh, his media training business, Phillips Media Relations. And he's just published a book that's on the bestseller list of, in the business section. It's called The Media Training Bible. I'm going to give, show you a copy right now. Uh, here's the cover. We could get it, let me get in front of the camera here. Uh, wonderful book. Um, I haven't read it all, but it's great. And I just want to uh, read a quick passage from it that kind of sums up this new world of media and social media. And I think, as one person said, Brad, uh, the word social is going to be removed soon. So mm. uh, you write uh, in your preface, this book will prepare you for today's media culture in which a tweet can become newsworthy and a news interview can become tweet worthy. And I just thought that was great in terms of summing it up. So uh, just tell me a little bit briefly about the book, uh, your, your uh, idea for writing it and how long it took. Just tell me for a couple before we get into the issues. Well, I've been writing a blog called Mr. Media Training for the past three years or so. And what I quickly found was happening is every time I would post a story that people liked, after I posted a few more stories, it would disappear and people would have to go digging for the content. And so I wanted to pull all of the most important content together in one book. I did it in the Media Training Bible. It's organized as 101 two-page lessons that go in chronological order and cover everything from the ground rules of working with reporters to and things you need to know to answer tough questions. Uh, we talk about how to develop a message and support it so you're not regurgitating the same words over and over. We do get into crisis communications and body language, both of which are obviously critical in today's media culture. And part of that, of course, is social media. So uh, you, the one other thing I'd say about the book is my hope for it is, yes, it's the media training Bible, but my hope is that it applies to every other form of communication as well. It applies for people giving presentations at staff meetings or applying for a job. Uh, or even trying to fight a ticket in court. The same communications elements that make you good in the media tend to make you good in virtually every other format as well. Great. Yeah, the, the book is super, and I've read many books uh, on the subject over the years. That's one of the best, so I wish oh, you Oh, thank you, Rich. And, uh, I'm sure it's going to be used in, uh, for those of you out there who may teach media relations, PR, crisis management, uh, or if you want to train some of your junior people, I highly recommend it. So with that, let's get to some of the issues, I, and I think we're going to be integrating some of your thoughts from the book and from your, uh, by the way, uh, Brad's blog is the most visited blog of media training in the world. Uh, which is fascinating. I was very impressed by that. So uh, check out his blog. It's mrmediatraining.com. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Mrmediatraining.com. Okay. So let's get to the topics. Uh, you know, when we do this show, we sometimes do stories that are a few days old. And today, uh, there's a very busy day in crisis management here in New York. Uh, two major incidents. We're just going to address one of them for the moment. And that was this uh, tragedy in Manhattan Harbor this morning, New York Harbor, uh, a ferry that was carrying passengers to the Wall Street area from New Jersey. Uh, it crashed into the pier. Uh, the story developed throughout the day. And as of uh, uh, broadcast time, some 80 passengers have been injured. And I think one or two critical, we don't have all the details yet. I want to run this video quickly uh, of the eyewitness news story, which should give you a little bit more background on it. So let me pull that tape up and we'll get right to it. And Bill, I'm back here at the scene, have been here actually all day long. You can see the ferry behind me, the gaping hole on the right front. The ferry that we're told has caused so 
much pain here today, but it will be told a short time from now, we're told, and it will be taken to a dry dock where the NTSB will begin its investigation. In the meantime, the chairman arrived here on the scene, the chairman at C Street. He said that they are stunned and shocked by the accident, that safety is their absolute priority. And he said this evening, their priority for the moment is getting families to passengers who are still hospitalized and cannot get home. Can you describe to them, Mary, pulled into gear 11 and never stopped. It, 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 it drove right into the gear. That's what we heard over and over this morning from witnesses who were on the ill-fated ferry. We rolled in slowly like we normally do, but it just it didn't stop this time. Some were what's called walking wounded. Yeah, I woke up from uh, being knocked out, six feet in the air behind me, and um, thank God I'm okay, and I, I'm not on a stretcher like everyone else. What went through your mind when you were thrown six feet? I felt like I was in the middle of a movie and watching a movie scene. Do you need your hand back there? But this drama was frighteningly real for the hundreds of passengers. Pier 11 was turned into a staging area for triage. The most seriously hurt victims rushed onto stretchers and into waiting ambulances. How badly are you hurt? The mayor came to survey the damage, and the president of C Street came to promise full cooperation with the investigation. Right now, we are working very hard with the Coast Guard to find out what the reason was. We are simply shocked and stunned that this happened. We know passengers rely on us for transportation and for safe transportation. And we are very sorry that this accident occurred. The witnesses will be critical to the investigation, and there are so many passengers as well as those waiting on the pier to board the ferry. <laughs> I want to. I think that was. Uh, let me just pull myself back into the uh, show here. So, Brad, I thought that was great. The the Jim Bar. I think it was Barker, the, the the chairman of the president of the company. The company's name is C Street out of New Jersey. The fact that he said, uh, "We are very sorry," very powerful. You could see his expression of his face. Let's talk about that vis-a-vis uh, -vis media training. It's unusual that somebody will be that straightforward and say, we are very sorry this happened. Typically, people won't be that straightforward uh, out of fear of uh, an admission of guilt and, and the liability that that could bring. So as an attorney, Rich, I'm wondering what you think. It, it, well, does I'm, that, I'm, I'm, does I'm that get attorney. close to, a, to <laughs> an admission of guilt? I'm not an attorney. If people mistake me for one, and I just have been in that business for a long time. As um, excuse, as a specialist in that field. Yeah. You know, I, I would say that um, one of the things that I run into very often with attorneys is this lack of uh, expression of sorrow. You don't have to admit guilt. You can say we're sorry it happened. There are ways to say it. Just like you and I talk all the time about there are ways of saying no comment without saying no comment. Happened there. One of us got knocked out. Google gave me some crazy message, so I, I just told our viewers we'll be back in a moment. So, what, where were we now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, I guess an internet network issue. But anyway, we were talking. Uh, go ahead. No. Uh, oh, the, the question of admission of liability, yes, admission of guilt. Yeah, and I was just saying that, uh, you know, the same way where we talk to lawyers, um, as PR people, uh, there are ways to uh, not admit uh, liability, if you will, the legal term, and still express sorrow at what happened and explain as this person did and as they did on their Twitter feed on the website, we're going to look into it, we're going to investigate it, we're going to cooperate with the, uh, the uh, Nas uh, NH uh, National Transportation Safety Board and uh, other, other uh, law enforcement and investigative uh, agencies. So. You know, I assume we're live again, Rich? We are. We are. We are. Okay. The other thing that surprised me about his statement, his language that he said, we are shocked and stunned this happened. Now, this is not the first time that Sea Streak has had a ferry accident. So it, that struck me as a little bit odd. How shocked and stunned can you be when there's a, a history of these types of accidents? Uh, I don't know the 2003 accident, if it was one of their, whether that was Sea Streak or not, but this has certainly happened before, and, and I think this falls short of being shocking at this point. So day one, day one, it seems like they responded well. The, the chairman's statement uh, certainly seemed to strike the right tone. Uh, the written statement that they released on their website also seemed to 
put the victims first, which is always what you want to see in a crisis. Uh, as the, the crisis communicator, Jane uh, Jordan Meyer, always says, now we enter the next stage of the crisis, which is the blame game. And we'll see if the public doesn't think this is shocking and that they should have put uh, uh, steps in, in place to make sure this didn't happen again so quickly, uh, well, they're not going to get away with saying that they're so shocked and surprised because the public may not see it that way. Yeah, good point. I, I want to pick up on that, and I appreciate you mentioning that. Uh, you know, in today's world, and you point this out in your book about the new media, you have to respond very quickly. And uh, in many situations that I'm sure you hear about through your clients, I certainly have heard it from mine, and that is, well, we talk to this newspaper, we talk to this TV station, that's enough. And I always say it's not enough. In fact, it's insufficient. So uh, example A today is, in fact, C Streak. Um, because when the incident happened just after 9 a.m. this morning, it wasn't until much later in the day that on their Twitter feed they came out with, their, I'm just going to read you their tweets because I think it's interesting. Uh, C Streak, Wall Street struck Pier 11 while docking this morning. For the latest updates, visit our website. Right after that, if you're a relative or of a person injured on the boat today and need assistance getting into Manhattan, please call us at the 800 number. And they get an A for that. They, that was real good crisis management, uh, thinking of the families and the injured. Next tweet was thanking uh, New York City's emergency responders. Good point there. And then the last tweet later in the day, we are working with the NTSB and Coast Guard to determine what happened today. Safety will be a number one priority. The problem that I had, uh, and you and I talked about this earlier, is that there's no tweet that says, we're sorry, our thoughts and prayers or our thoughts are with the victims. Uh, that should have been the very first tweet because as I, I pointed out uh, and uh, some other people were talking about in, in the tweetosphere today, the very first thing you have to do is put something out on Twitter when something like this happens because reporters uh, are not necessarily going to go to your website first. They're going to go to Twitter. They're going to go to Facebook to see what you're saying and see what other people are saying about you. So maybe you could pick up on that for a moment. Yeah, well, as you pointed out, this accident happened during the morning rush hour, and their first tweet was sent at 3.57. Now, the only saving grace for them is that they only have 310 Twitter followers, and that's as of now. So at, at, at 8 o'clock this morning, before the accident happened, there's a good chance they had 100 or 150. So they didn't have a whole lot of followers. More people likely saw their statement on the website. But they certainly didn't follow the best practice. And, and what I say in, in the media training Bible is you need to be present in your own coverage. And that usually means saying something in the first 30 minutes. Obviously, they're not going to know all the facts in the first 30 minutes. And, and nobody really expects them to. Right. But what they do know is that there's an incident, something happened. And what they could say is we're aware of the incident. Our people are on the way to the scene. Uh, and we will report more as soon as we know it. That, at a very minimum, they could have said they didn't. They waited about seven hours before they posted their first tweet. That's a mistake. Right, and, and I also want to and thank, thank you for that, Brad. I think also it's very interesting now that I think about it, as we speak, I'm looking at, I'm going to pull up their uh, statement from their website. Now, we heard the uh, president of the company say we are very sorry, but now, you know, we talk about messaging, and you talk a lot about this in your book, which is, a very important part of crisis management. And I don't know can you, if you could read this, folks, but I'm going to read you just a little bit of this piece here. Um, our priority continues to, this is, it says, Dear C Street Rise, this is the homepage of the website. They did a good job making it front and center. Too many companies bury this stuff. So our priority continues to be the people who are injured. Right now, we're working to bring family members to the city and to make other arrangements to help them. We want to thank New York City's emergency responders for arriving on the scene, blah, blah, blah. Our thoughts, and, our thoughts and press continue to be with those who were injured. We are simply shocked and stunned that this happened. I didn't say sorry. I said we're simply shocked and stunned. We know passengers rely on us to provide safe transit on our boats, and safety is the number one concern for our company. We are very sorry this accident occurred. Now, you talk in your book about leading with your best stuff, your most important fact. Now, maybe I'm nitpicking here. This is a good statement. But if I had written it for them, I think the first thing I would say is, we are sorry this has happened. We're, we're, our thoughts are with the people. It's buried in there. So what, what's your take on that in terms of, you know, order of importance? Well, I think you're, the, the importance of putting the victims first is uh, it's critical because the public will judge your handling of a, of a crisis based on how well you treat the people who were hurt. 
Uh, and uh, so I'm actually a little bit more forgiving of this statement. I thought they did an okay job there. Our priority continues to be the people who are injured. Right now we're working to bring family members to the city and to make other arrangements to help them. I thought that was pretty good. You might then bounce up there. The, we are very sorry this happened a little bit closer to the top, but I'm somewhat forgiving of them. I thought they did a reasonably good job in this statement. Yeah, so I think to sum up this story, maybe uh, uh, shift some of the messaging, but also get your statement out earlier. I think that's fair to say. Yes, yeah, start yeah. communicating early, because if they're not out there speaking, other people are, and other people are. For example, if I happen to be uh, in lower Manhattan today, and uh, a reporter had stuck a microphone in my face, what I would have said is, I can't believe this happened again. Well, guess what? Other people who take the ferry every day likely remember that this isn't the first one. If you're the company, that's not what you want people talking about. You have some control over that if you're filling up some of the media air with your own content. Uh, if you're not present in your coverage, other people are going to fill that media vacuum for you. Right. Great point. And that's exactly what happened today because Eyewitness News for One and NBC, they were there in, or very quickly interviewing witnesses. And it's their version of the facts versus the companies as well. And if you have someone who is going to go off the deep end criticizing the company or criticizing the way that you, your captain of the boat handled the crisis, then you have to prove you have, you know, you're in a defensive situation uh, and you're fighting the, the inaccuracies, the rumors of what really happened. That's right. And, and as a New Yorker, I, I, I feel pretty liberated to say New Yorkers and New Jerseyans have a wonderful way of saying things. And they tend to be blunt and they tend to be to the point and they tend to create these really great, memorable, evocative media sound bites. Uh, and so if you're a company trying to maintain your brand, you don't want them filling up the air with that because, you know, it's going to be inherently interesting. Yeah, I think in your book, Brad, uh, you talk about uh, rule of thirds, if you will. Uh, I don't have it in front of me that section, but maybe you could help us. It was like one third is what the reporters are saying, one third is what your opponent or adversary might be saying, and one third is your voice, right? That's right. I make the case in the book that there are three voices in many media stories. It's it's your voice, your opponent's voice, and the voice of the media. And if this company isn't speaking for the first few hours of the crisis, your opponents are. And the opponents may not be that antagonistic in this case. It may be victims uh, and bystanders. Uh, but it's certainly not your voice. Uh, and the people that are talking, those victims, for example, will influence the media. So it influences their reporting. They have no counterbalance. They don't have the company's side to put in. So inevitably, you go 0 for 2 in the story because your opponents are talking and they influence the media, which end up siding more with your opponents or the people that are speaking about you. So I always say be present in your coverage. It's better to go 1 for 3 than, than 0 for 2. And in the early hours, that seemed to happen. They seemed to get that right as the day went on. Sure. Okay. Well, I think we'll wrap this piece together. Kind of, uh, uh, I'm sure we'll learn more the next few days. And it's always interesting to look at day two and three, in my view. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Okay. Next story, folks, is um, this story about Allstate. And uh, apparently, uh, Allstate took some pictures of uh, a block or a family's destroyed home on Staten Island. For those of you, uh, who have been following Superstorm Sandy. Staten Island, New York, got hit the hardest of, of all the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, and they're still devastated, just as a public service announcement. People still need help out there and in other places like the Rockaways. So in this case, uh, the, people's, uh, the people whose home was destroyed, they saw this ad uh, by Allstate and they were shocked because, first of all, they didn't, apparently they didn't get their, the money they were supposed to get. So Brad, you read a little bit about this, right? Maybe you could pick up the ball from there. I'm trying to bleed in a little bit. Yeah, sure. Well, Allstate filmed a television commercial, and they, they used as B-roll or video this victim's house. Well, unfortunately uh, for Allstate, they apparently didn't vet uh, who lived in that house, and it turns out it was one of their customers, and they were denying the claim. So the, the story, as I understand it, is the, the, uh, the couple did not have flood insurance, and therefore the company said they were only entitled to $10,000 because had they had the flood insurance policy, they would have gotten more. What the, the couple that lives in the house maintains is that the damage occurred before the first uh, drop of water even came in, that it was the wind that took down the house. And so the couple was, uh, the family that lived there was outraged that here they are fighting Allstate, their insurance company, for some proceeds, and, uh, and in the meantime, the company is using their house to complement what a great job all state insurance agents have been doing. So uh, understandably, they were upset by that. 
Yeah, and I, I think what's interesting, and this takes us uh, to the media relations side of the story. I, I found this video of uh, from CNBC. I'm just going to play this audio here. Uh, it, it's pretty, it pretty much speaks for itself, and then um, we'll, we'll analyze that. We want to mention that we had previously uh, promoted Tom Wilson, Allstate CEO, was scheduled to be with us right about now in this hour. He was booked to react to the fiscal cliff tax deal and how it impacts his business. Now, we also alerted his office that in addition to that topic, we felt we were obliged to also ask him about a developing national story regarding Superstorm Sandy and a Staten Island uh, couple whose home was destroyed as a result. Allstate has offered $10,000 on their claim because the insurer feels the home was destroyed due to flooding. The couple maintains it was wind that took their home. In the meantime, Allstate has used images of this couple's destroyed home in commercials about its hurricane response, and the couple is now considering legal action as a result. Well, Mr. Wilson canceled his appearance with us when he learned that this story would come up during our interview. We would like to say he is always welcome here on The Closing Bell and on CNBC in the future. By the way... So... I think that was fascinating from, from our standpoint, a CEO canceling an interview because of a tough question. So let's talk about that, Brad. Have you had that happen in, with your clients? Uh, uh, they've come to you and said, well, should I go on? Should I not? Uh, could be controversial. How do you handle that? Well, sure. And, uh, you know, Sam Donaldson, the, the, the former ABC News uh, journalist, had this expression that I love. He said, the questions don't do the damage, only the answers do. There's exceptions to that rule, of course, but in this case, they should very easily have been able, the CEO should have very easily been able to anticipate this question and answer it well. Uh, I don't understand why he didn't do the interview and say, you know, we take these types of situations very seriously. I am aware of the situation. I know that this couple is hurting. I'm looking into it, and my hope is to continue the conversation so that we can resolve this uh, in, in the way that the policy uh, requires or the policy uh, dictates something, some kind of humanity or something. Uh, instead, he created so much more damage uh, by refusing to do it. The public takes a no comment like that as guilty. So now anybody watching that believes there's something fishy there and that the couple's probably right. Yeah, and I would go further. I think in broadcast and because it's CNBC and it's high profile, uh, it's magnified. That no comment, if you will. Uh, having a, a, a respected broadcaster going on air saying he declined to appear uh, to talk about the fiscal cliff. And, uh, you know, like, like, like you say, this is what media training crisis management is all about. You have to be prepared for that. You can't always have it your way. Uh, and I wonder, by the way, Brad, you know, in your experience, sometimes uh, it's the CEO who makes that call, but sometimes it's the PR advisors who make that call, right? I mean, don't go on because you may get in trouble. So what's your advice to them? Well, let me be a little provocative here, because based on the statements that I saw coming out of Allstate, I'm not surprised they reacted this way. Everything that they've done in this case that I've seen publicly has been tone deaf and has just been all wrong. So this latest instance of the CEO not appearing uh, is consistent with that. Let me just give you a few quotes here that the, spokes the spokesperson from Allstate uh, has said. First, she said, the TV spot was made, quote, in accordance with all applicable advertising laws. Who cares? Who's, nobody's accusing them of breaking the law and filming an advertisement. They're being accused of incredible insensitivity and denying a claim. So that's, that was the first ridiculous thing. But then yeah. she continued by saying, uh, we have committed to reaching out to them to discuss their concerns and are committed to resolving the matter in accordance with the policy they purchased from our company. Okay, that's fine. It is our understanding that the Trienus, I think that's how you pronounce their last name, chose to drop their flood insurance policy before Sandy struck. We encourage our customers to consider flood insurance to protect themselves in ways that would not be covered under a homeowner's policy. So there are two sins that I see there. First of all, the statement borders on blaming the victim. Yeah. It may be true, and there may be ways of getting out that information publicly, but they did not do it in a particularly graceful way. Second, it almost sounded like she was making a sales pitch for her product. Buy flood insurance. It was so self-serving. It was so pointing the finger. Look, I'm not saying all state is wrong on the facts. The truth is the couple may have dropped their flood insurance. I don't know if wind or water uh, uh, made the house 
uh, destroyed the house. I wasn't there. Let's, I'll take the couple at their word. Um, but what, what's clear is their tone in, in, uh, in blaming the family it was, was just awful. And, and so, yeah, it's consistent with what the CEO did on air and did the PR advisor tell him not to appear. Based on that statement, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, it's it's very often the PR advisor uh, and all the lawyers. Uh, th what's interesting about this also, Brad, is that we did a piece uh, on this show, I guess, maybe four or five months ago, about another insurance company, Progressive Insurance. Uh, the facts were different, but the, the, the results were the same. It was deny a claim, uh, and what happened was the... Uh, the person who was denied the claim went went on social media and made it public, built a Facebook page, and really hammered Progressive. Uh, so it was very interesting. The, and again, uh, they came out with a statement that was blame the blame the victim and and Rich about that about that Progressive story. One very uh, probably little noticed part of that story. You, you probably your viewers all probably know Flo, the spokeswoman for Progressive. She's the one that appears in all of the ads. She has her hair in the bun. She has this, this warm, wide smile. So in all of Progressive's tweets about that incident, next to it is the avatar of this big, smiling uh, flow. And it was so incongruous with the message that they were sending out. That's something that uh, this is far beyond Progressive. But you wonder if, if in crisis, companies need to pay attention to those kinds of details too, what the picture and the avatar is communicating. If it's tragedy and the person is smiling broadly, there's a message disconnect there. So a, a small point, but one that companies should probably think about. No, that's a great point. And you know what? You just made me aware of it. It's something I haven't thought about, so thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, very, it's, it's that kind of detail that, that people need to pay attention to. Uh, because these are subtle things, but uh, in public opinion, they build up and people notice them. Absolutely. So, um, okay, so um, we'll have to see how, you know, as I said, I, it, when you have case studies, you know, I'm shocked that companies of this size can screw up this kind of uh, crisis management because there's a history. There's history in your own industry. Uh, and to, uh, to mess that up is just, you know, you know, it would have been much easier to say, we're really sorry we did this. We're going to make the clam right, and we're never going to do this again with the images. We're going to we're going to examine our marketing materials and go through everything. And, and remember what this was. This was a, a TV spot praising all states' insurance agents. This was not a audience-focused message about we will do everything to help those affected by Hurricane Sandy. This was about, hey, aren't our agents great? Uh, and so the very necessity of that being the message that was out kind of made the fact that they messed it up that much worse. Yeah, and I think there was a story earlier this week. I'm not going to get into the details. But AIG, same thing, uh, had the same issue. Uh, they put out a big commercial, and in the same breath, they're threatening to sue the U.S. government because they didn't get the right interest rate on the bailout. You know, again, reputation. Uh, you know, they don't think about public opinion. So, and that 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 there is a dollar cost to that. There's a revenue cost to that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to add on this story, on this piece? Uh, no, I think we covered the the big part of the Allstate story. Okay. So our next piece, uh, our final segment, if you will, before we get more into Brad's book, is uh, Cinemark, which is the parent company for uh, many movie theaters across the United States. I think they also have operations in Latin America. Um, and many of you know there was a massive shooting uh, before the screening of The Dark Knight uh, last summer, and... What happened was there was this invitation that went out just before Christmas, uh, before the Christmas holidays, inviting the families of the victims uh, to the reopening of the theater in Aurora, Colorado. Um, and, of course, this all happens in an environment while this trial of the shooter is going on, so there's another element to that. So, Brad, why don't you pick it up from there uh, and talk, talk to me about what's wrong with this or what's not wrong with it. Well, as I understand it, the families, a group of the families got together and blasted Cinemark in a letter saying how insensitive it was. But it wasn't just that they, that the, that they were upset that, that Cinemark had invited them to come to the theater. Uh, and it wasn't just that they received the invitation on December 27th, two days after Christmas, which really ruffled the feathers of a lot of the family members, saying that these holidays, the first without their loved one, they were hard enough without kind of the insult to injury of getting this, I think it was actually an email invitation to it. 
But as I looked into the story, it was a little bit more complicated than that. First of all, some relatives do want to go to this remembrance. Second of all, it may not be a remembrance by Cinemark. Uh, the, the governor of the state of Colorado plans to attend. The mayor of Aurora plans to attend. And it's not Cinemark, as I understand it, that sent out the invitation. It's a group called the Colorado Organization for Victim Assistance. What really seemed to upset the families was that they had virtually no communication from Cinemark early on. Uh, well, they, not after the tragedy, right? Right. That okay. Cinemark after never... August 2012, okay. Right. Cinemark never apologized. This, this is coming from the families. Uh, they never apologized to them. They never made contact. The families apparently repeatedly asked Cinemark to meet with them without attorneys present. What they said, parent to parent, Cinemark refused. So I think they were very upset with Cinemark's handling of this from the very start, so that by the time the invitation came, December 27th, they were already so angry at, at the, the movie chain that almost anything they did at that point would be perceived as wrong. But the takeaway for me is it's so important for companies to be in contact and communicate with victims early on. When you are seen, and we talked about this, uh, I think, in the Allstate case, uh, yeah. When you're, when you're, or, or, or the ferry accident, actually, when you're seen as cold and, and not treating victims of a tragedy well, public opinion will form uh, negatively toward you. Uh, public opinion will be negative toward you if you're not seen as as, as caring about the victim. And, and that happens so quickly, right? I mean, this happens, especially with social media and and, and coverage of the tragedy, over literally overnight now. These things happen. Uh, they they do, and, and you know this will probably end up in in litigation. There, some of the things that have come out, some of the bodies apparently remained in the theater for 19 hours. Uh, families are very upset that Cinemark didn't do everything they could have for uh, to secure the movie theater. Uh, so this is this is probably going to be litigated and going to court. There have been studies. There's a famous one out of Johns Hopkins. I think this uh, happened in 2004, 2005, where they they looked at malpractice, and, and what they found was that people that admitted guilt early on, yes, in some cases they were still sued, but the settlements tended to be lower than the people who dragged it on, didn't apologize, because they, they created so much ire among the, the people who ended up being the plaintiffs that the plaintiffs at that point were just putting the pedal to the metal and, and just wanted, uh, wanted to get as much out of them as they could. And, and there are some case studies that suggest by treating the victims well early in a crisis, not only is it the right thing to do, uh, but it may actually be financially the smarter thing to do. Yeah, and this is a big disconnect. Uh, when you have lawsuits, you have civil lawsuits, uh, very often the attorneys say, don't say anything, don't say anything. And the problem with that is you have to be able to express some empathy. And it's a fine line. I understand that. I'm not a lawyer, but from, from the, the clients I've talked to, it is a fine line. But we have to move in a different direction. We have to teach attorneys that the court of public opinion is what matters. It's going to matter in terms of your settlement, in terms of whether a case goes your way or not. Uh, it is the only court that matters. Uh, so for those of you out there listening, uh, if your attorneys are telling you just uh, uh, put your head in the sand and don't say anything and don't feel anything, that's, that's not going to work for you. you. You could be out of business before your court victory. So... Yeah, and what I say in the media training Bible is, look, lawyers have important things to say. They need to be in the room. You need Absolutely. to be in the room, yeah. too. Uh, and, and what executives should be doing is listening to both. What tends to happen in crisis is, is uh, executives are freaked out. They tend to over-prioritize listening to, the, to the, uh, what the attorneys are telling them and, and take that action. Recent case, Toyota, just uh, it, it, I saw a story this week. I think it was out of one of the uh, University of California schools. And, and what they found was that the delay in Toyota's uh, handling of that crisis, the sudden acceleration crisis, their delay in handling that ended up costing a lot more than had they admitted the problems very early on. So there's a financial cost to waiting, and, and Cinemark may find out that it, this ended up costing them a lot more than had they treated the families well from the beginning and maybe even made some small admissions along the way. Yeah, and I've seen this over and over again where you know just from reading the news story that, they're, that the companies are being hamstrung by the attorneys who don't want to talk about it, don't want them talking about it. And again, it, it does cost. I want to raise another issue around this Aurora situation that uh, is interesting as well, and that is when you have a crisis that's being pinned on you. Uh, 
in this case at cinema, but to your point that there were other parties involved, an organization, a governor, a mayor, um, how do you, as a media advisor, as a, as a media trainer, what do you advise clients on when, it, when they're faced with something like this and you have uh, multiple uh, parties, if you will, trying to organize an event like this? Who owns it? And should somebody own it and take control of it? Sure. Uh, to, to your question, yes, they should. And, you know, the other thing in this case that seemed to me to be so totally preventable is I wonder why they sent this as an email. What I wonder is almost if an ambassador from this group, and maybe this happened, but what I would have advised is that an, adv an ambassador from this group, Colorado Organization for Victim Assistance, had gone to some of the family members offline before an invitation was ever sent out said, we're thinking about doing this remembrance at the movie theater. Our thinking behind it is that some families may want to do it at the theater as a closure. As, as some, I hate the word closure because you never have full right. closure to a tragedy Plus. like this. But, but to have some kind of remembrance uh, at this, how do you feel about that? Would you like to do that? Do you think the other families would? Would you feel comfortable talking to some of the families about that and getting some sense of whether this would be more harm than good or whether this might be helpful? So I wonder about the very sending of an email invitation here. Look, there are there were far too many victims, obviously, but there weren't so many that they couldn't have been contacted oh, individually. Absolutely. The last email is not the way probably to have handled this. So I wonder if that, too, wasn't e even more... Um, just rubbing salt in the wound that existed from their poor handling of it early on. Right, and again, very often in crisis situations, it's not uh, malevol malevolence, it's more ignorance. And very often we see that, but the public doesn't know the difference very often. Uh, they can think you're being malicious and, and unfeeling and uncaring when in fact it's just somebody in that company made a bad decision. Sure, and their motives may have been right. And by the way, that is one of the reasons that people make really big mistakes and don't apologize the right way. I say this in the book, that what happens a lot of times is that people will say, in a case like this, they'll say, wait a minute, we did this remembrance because we wanted to help the families. I don't understand why we're being... So then they get this natural sense of, uh, uh, of defensiveness. So they can't apologize the right way because they feel their motives, their genuine motives, are being impugned by the public unfairly doesn't matter if you feel that way. You, they may be, but it doesn't matter. The, the best thing to do in that circumstance is immediately respond to it. We hear you. We're sorry. Let us make it right. Right. And just uh, for our viewers, uh, after every show, we post some show notes at www.thecrisisshow.com. And uh, one of the, the links we're going to put up tomorrow is this letter I have in front of me uh, from the families of the victims. And it's a pretty harsh letter from January 2nd, 2013, uh, published in the Denver Post. Uh, you can check it out on your own time, but I'll, uh, I'll certainly post that tomorrow because it does go to the, uh, uh, using words like callousness and cold and, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to read. You know, it's hard to read because you do feel for these people what they've been through. So, um, uh, We'll do that tomorrow. Um, okay, let me just see if there's anything else on Aurora. Uh, I think we're pretty wrapped on that piece, um, piece of it. Would you agree? We'll yeah, on. I think we covered the main points. T terrible story. I mean, uh, one after another, we seem to keep talking about these mass shootings. So uh, hopefully those families find some kind of peace. Absolutely, absolutely. T totally agree with that. And uh, uh, the good news is I think that this, this country is having a national dialogue uh, about guns. And uh, no matter which way it goes, it's about time at least that there's a conversation. And everybody's got to be part of it. So that's a good sign, I think. Uh, we hope some good comes out of it. Okay, so um, getting back to your book, my friend. Again, it's the uh, Media Training Bible. It, it uh, looks good when you hold it up there, right? <laughs> I like that, yeah. It looks upside down to me, so I'm glad to do <laughs> it's, it's the way the screen is, obviously. Uh, 101 things you absolutely, positively need to know before your next interview. When was this book published, by the way? Uh, Speak Good Press. Okay, and, and how long? And it was, it, was published in, uh, it was published in December. It's been okay. out for about a month, uh, and uh, I have been very fortunate. The people who read the Mr. Media Training blog have been buying it. They've been spreading the word. They've been writing reviews on their blogs and spreading it through social media. I have been truly, you never know what to expect when you put out a book. I have been blown away by, by the sales of it, by the, the word of mouth on it. It has been a probably one of the most humbling and rewarding experiences of my career. I'm glad to hear that. And, and again, you know, as a colleague, 
uh, great book, but I also want to say that you know it's books like this that help all of us in the business to educate, and really that's what we're doing. What you're doing with your book, and what I'm trying to do with the show is to help people uh, get it right uh, to prevent these kinds of mistakes, so so that they can communicate better. So let's get into some of the uh, meat of this. There are two things uh, uh, I wanted to draw attention to. First of all. Uh, you're a former uh, journalist, I'm a former journalist, so it's interesting, the part about the three kinds of dangerous reporters. <laughs> and I know we're going to get some grief on this probably. Oh, by the way, for, for our viewers' benefit, uh, Brad is a former, is a producer at, at Nightline? Or Yes, uh, an associate producer uh, at uh, with with ABC us. News and with uh, CNN. So what, you know, before we even get to the book, let me ask you a question, uh, because it's always interesting to me. You worked with Ted Koppel, uh, and uh, by the way, you know, a legend, and then you got to work with Wolf Blitzer. T talk to me about the different styles and, the show, uh, and your experience working in, in that kind of environment, particularly because Nightline is a different kind of show than Late Night uh, with Wolf Blitzer. So go ahead. I just want to hear a little bit of your... First of all, I was in my mid-20s to, mid to early 30s, and I'm not sure when I was that age I could fully appreciate how amazing it was where I was. I mean, my office at ABC News, what my desk was the first desk outside of Ted Koppel's office. So five feet behind me was Ted Koppel's door. So I saw him every day for a couple of years. And uh, the experience from him, what I really appreciated about his style of journalism is I worked with him for two years and still to this day have no idea how he votes when he goes into a voting booth. Uh, I have no idea if he's liberal or conservative. There were Fox shows. News will probably tell you something differently. <laughs> <laughs> they might. Uh, they might. But uh, what I can tell you is when I worked with him, I had no sense. And I would watch one show and say, he's taking a kind of liberal perspective on this one. And then I'd watch another one and say, eh, this one's a little bit more conservative. And like a foreign policy show, it wasn't uncommon that he seemed like more of a hawk than a dove. And on social issues, he seemed maybe more liberal than... I, I have no idea where he was, but I really appreciated that, that he didn't inject his own views into it. Uh, and Wolf, Wolf really is what he appears to be on the air. Uh, collegial, uh, collaborative, nice. I think he likes being on camera. He likes being recognized. I think he, uh, I think he's fully aware of the... The aura. <laughs> the opportunity he has is as an anchor to go to the places he does and be recognized. I think he loves his job. I think it comes through... Uh, on the air. I, I, they both have very different styles, but I can tell you, I, I liked working for both of them and learned different things from both. So, uh, you know, I was, uh, boy, what a, what a start to a career in the media business on, and now on this side of it than to work for those two men. No, I mean, uh, I had to ask that because I'm a big fan. I remember starting watching Koppel from America Held Hostage in November 79. Uh, in fact, somebody had tweeted about, you know, they guess they were much younger than me, and they said, oh, that, that show that started in the, in the early 80s, I said, no, in fact, it was November 79, America held hostage, and that led to, and I was a, a, a loyal, loyal watcher for years, and, I, and one of the interviews, just as an aside, that's fascinating for those, can you still hear me, Brad? I hear you fine. I, mean, I thought you froze up, but we have sometimes these technical problems, but yeah. forgive me. Um, one of the, you know, I think it's always good for media trainers, for publicists, for crisis management to go crisis manager people, to go back and look at some of these interviews. And the one that I recall was the uh, interview he did with, I think it was uh, it was one of the baseball commissioners, and he made a comment, a racist comment. Okay, so this was, uh, I think it was 1987, Al Campanis. He was Thank a, you. I Thank think you. it was a vice president for the L.A. Dodgers. Right. Thank and, you. Uh, so he says to uh, Al Campanis, why are there not more black executives in baseball? And just to give a little bit of context here, Al Campanis, uh, he played with Jackie Robinson. He was a friend of Jackie Robinson. The reason he was on the air that night was because I think they were doing the 40th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in baseball. So you know, Campanis was not known as a racist character. He was, if anything, known as someone who was friendly to the first black player in the game. Unfortunately, when Koppel said, why aren't there more black executives, uh, Campanis' answer was, uh, well, they, they lack what it requires to be a field manager. I think they he used the word like faculties or something like that. I don't yeah, remember. I mean, it was dismissive that they weren't capable was the, right. the uh, upshot of his comments. Koppel, tried to, Koppel was not trying to do a gotcha interview. It was a soft piece about Jackie Robinson. He tried to let him bail out and say, Mr. Campanis, you can't really mean what you just said. 
Uh, I'm going to take a commercial. We'll come back. I'll ask you again. Came back. Campanis gave the same answer. Uh, and he said, why aren't there more black quarterbacks? Uh, you know, they... And it got worse from there, right. And it got and, worse from there, yeah. yeah. And you make it, and thank you for that, that, that uh, context. I, I think it's a, it's a great lesson in, in media training crisis management because here you, you made the point. You're not necessarily going into a hostile interview, and yet, because of, you weren't prepared... Uh, you got pinned with that. Now today, that would have been the tweet heard around the world. Uh, you know, uh, he, he got off easy in that regard. But I, I don't even remember what happened to him after that in terms of his career. He was gone. He, he, he was immediately fired by the Dodgers That's uh, within, within 48 hours. And you know, one of the one of the, my favorite lessons in the book is something I call the seven second stray. It's okay. this idea that if you are on message for 59 minutes and 53 seconds of a one hour long interview. Doesn't but for matter. seven seconds, you say something flip sarcastic off your message, inevitably that's what the media is going to use almost every time. Uh, unfortunately for Campanis, the seven-second stray wasn't seven seconds in an hour-long interview. It was seven seconds in a decades-long career. Uh, think about Tony Hayward of, of British Petroleum. I'd like my life back. <laughs> it's like a three-second stray. So unfortunately, or you know, in the age of social media and the speed with which our words get dissected and sent around the web, we no longer have the luxury for even a two or three second stray anymore. Yeah, and just on a personal note, I know when I post something, even when there's a mistake in it, I'm like, okay, I got to get back on and delete that and, and fix it because I maybe I spelled the name wrong or I was a typo, and I worry about that stuff. And we all do, I guess, to varying degrees of stress. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it's uh, it's our reputation at stake. Um, so that's an interesting point. I want. I think we're going to talk about the three dangerous reporters, and I, I digressed a little bit. If you don't mind returning to that. Sure. Quick. Yeah. Well, well, the first one I talk about is the friendly reporter, the person who, I think the example I give in the book is, uh, there was one night I went out to dinner with a, a female friend of mine, and in the middle of our meal, she looked over to the bar, and she kind of groaned, and I said, what's going on? And she said, well, see that guy over there? He's hitting on her, and he's hitting on this woman sitting alone at the bar, but she said he, he he's that guy who just persists, and he's laughing at her jokes, and he his motives for what he wants to happen that night are so transparent and obvious. Um, and so that made me think about kind of the relation to reporters and that just like the guy at the bar who will say whatever he has to to get what he wants, um, some reporters are the same way. They will pretend they're your friend. They'll get you comfortable. After 20 minutes of talking to them, you might think to yourself, oh, this guy's not so bad. Okay, he's not gonna he's not gonna uh, make me look bad in the news story. So you, get, you let your guard down. Yeah, you relax. And that's when you say something that or ends she. up in the story that you or she, that, thank you, that ends up, uh, I always think that, yeah. It, it, so <laughs> I always think of the guy being the jerk, but the truth is that the, the female... It doesn't matter today. We're in 50 gray territory, you kidding me? Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> uh, I was giving women the benefit of the doubt that they yeah. were uh, nicer <laughs> in those circumstances. But the truth is uh, that you, you need to be really careful of, of saying something. Ultimately, what I say in the book is the, the, the reporter's loyalty was always to the story. It was, it was never to you. It's not to say that the reporter was out to get you, but if you say something interesting when you let your guard down, it's reportable, it's on the record, so beware of the friendly reporter. The second type I talk about is the silent type. And the silent type, and I, I know I'm not going to name names, or I don't even want to give context because if the person sees this interview, I don't want them to know who I'm talking about. There is somebody that I know in my life that you sit down and you talk to them and you will finish your sentence, And that silence is so uncomfortable that you just rush in to fill it. Reporters know that trick. They use that trick. So you get to the end of your answer. Oftentimes you're on message. You get to the end of your answer, and then the reporter just sits and looks at you or expectantly says, uh-huh, and nods their head and just waits. Uh, well, guess what? A lot of people are so flustered by the discomfort of that circumstance, they rush in to fill the vacuum with words, and those words aren't usually things they've thought about before. Oftentimes, that ends up being the most important uh, or the thing that ends up getting reported. So the second reporter to look out for is that silent type. Uh, and the third one I talk about in the book is the jerk. Now, there was a guy, I, I think he subsequently retired. He was a reporter for the Associated Press. He, in a former life, when I was doing media relations work, would call and make these really nasty accusatory comments, such as, you've been trying to do this for 10 years. You guys haven't accomplished anything. Why don't you quit already? And wow. I found myself 
I mean, you naturally get defensive, and you, you. I found myself actually getting angry when right. I was on the other end of the phone because I knew what we were trying to do, and I really didn't appreciate him baiting me that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately, I, I, you always realize that the audience you're trying to reach is not a jerky reporter from the Associated Press, but it is the person on the other end of the exchange, the person reading it. So if I react angrily, that angry, snappish reaction makes its way into the story. So what right. I tried to do is essentially rewrite his question in my mind. And, and so his, his accusation, you haven't accomplished anything, I would rewrite to something along the lines of, what have you accomplished? And then I would say, you know, I disagree with the premise of your question. Let me tell you what we have accomplished. And I would do it with an even tone and try to do it in a manner that showed I wasn't flustered at all. Uh, so that was that's one way of handling a, a really jerky reporter. Wow, interesting. You know, um, one of the things that we talked about earlier was um, keeping uh, keeping reporters honest. And one of the ways to do that is, and it, it goes to your blog today, uh, for those of us in, in public relations uh, who advise executives, uh, do you want to be, uh, be present when that interview happens, whether it's broadcast or print, whether it's being recorded live to tape or live? Uh, so talk to me a little bit about your blog today. I guess some, did you pose the question or was it a response to somebody else's question? Actually, a, a reporter from Sports Illustrated tweeted out last month this question. So the journalist here, how do you react when a PR person insists on monitoring an in-person or phone interview with the subject? Curious. Right. And the responses were really fascinating. Uh, some people, some reporters said they didn't care. Some really were upset. One guy said, I'm okay until they interject. <laughs> If there's a don't answer that or please ask that differently, I turn into the Hulk. I love that response. Um, so some reporters, it really upset them. Look, I, I think this was one of those blog posts where the readers of the blog, um, MrMediaTraining.com, that's the plug I have to give for the blog, the readers weighed in in the comment section. And they, I mean, the great thing about blogging is smart people make you smarter. And uh, one of the thing, the key I realized after the conversation in the comment section was it comes down to motive. Why is the PR person there? What's their motive? And if the motive is to be a hindrance, uh, no wonder reporters uh, uh, object to them being there. But if it's clearly there to help and facilitate and jump in only when the spokesperson or the the person the interview is being arranged for doesn't remember or or can't find a key fact and then can, can help, or what happens a lot of the time is during the course of the conversation, the, the person being interviewed will say, you know, I, I don't have that in front of me. We'll get that to you. And the PR person scribbles that down and then follows up with the report. That's all innocuous. So I think okay. if the reporter sees it that way and, and that you're not trying to be a hindrance, I, I would think, I certainly would hope that most reporters wouldn't object to that. But, and I've done that. I've played that role. And I'm very cautious. Because I'm a former journalist, I understand that. So I usually just keep quiet. And I'll say to the uh, journalist, listen, I'm just, I'm here to learn too. I, I'm, it's my opportunity to talk to my client and listen in. I'm just taking notes anyway. And maybe I'll direct them to some additional information. So maybe a question didn't come up. I may say, you know what, um, there's some other data you may want to look at. And when we get done with this meeting, I'll hand it to you or I'll direct you to it. Uh, something that a CEO or a manager partner of a law firm might not think about uh, during the interview. But I also want to maybe direct the story in a good direction. So I've never had a problem with someone asking me to leave a room or to hang up the phone. Uh, the thing is to be transparent, let the yes. reporter know way in advance that uh, this is not for any legal reasons, just so you know, this is our role. You know? and, uh, Listen, I think sometimes people forget the, the, the term is media relations. Relations right. is relationship. This is not supposed to be, and in most circumstances it's not, adversarial. Right. 90-some percent of the interviews I've done in my life on behalf of clients or on behalf of myself are not adversarial. Some are. So obviously you should be prepared for the questions that you don't expect or the challenging or hostile ones. But media relations is about building relationships. And if you tick off a reporter by being too aggressive when you're sitting in on an interview with somebody else, it's going to make it much harder for you to have a positive relationship going forward with that reporter. So you know, absolutely, that's a key thing for people to remember. That's a great point. And, and I would just add from a crisis standpoint, just to pick up on that, uh, when you're in a crisis situation, the relationships that you build with the media before those crises are going to help you build goodwill during a crisis and thereafter to, to rebuild your reputation. Uh, so it should be an ongoing part of your business, even if you're, uh, if you're a nonprofit part of your organization, to reach out to those reporters 
to let them know what you're working on and, and send them good stories. Don't send them junk. I think we'd all agree that part of the problem today is people just want to get search engine results. They put stuff on PR web and just throw out this stuff that's not newsworthy. So I always, uh, in my advice to clients, I put on my journalist hat first and I'll push back. If a client says to me, oh, let's just you know, get the press release out and I'll say, why? <laughs> let's, is it newsworthy? And I'll try to give them the best advice I can. Uh, or maybe give them an alternative. Another, maybe it's a pitch letter. Maybe it's not a media story. Maybe it's a social media story. So there's different ways to think about getting your message out. But the important thing to do is to build those relationships early on uh, so that when you're in a crisis situation or you're in a pickle, uh, you will have the opportunity to be heard. I think that's, that's fair to say. Sure. And I, what I always say is, if you have great relationships with the media before a crisis hits, that doesn't guarantee you good press when the crisis comes. That's correct. And it does usually mean that they're more willing to give you the benefit of the doubt early on. And that benefit of the doubt early on can really drive what the storyline becomes. So the relationships with, you have with reporters before a crisis comes may be, I always say, I always hesitate to say it's the most important thing, but it sure is one of the most important parts of crisis management, what happens before the crisis ever hits. Absolutely. And, and again, just to re reiterate what you're saying in a different way, you know, it's about getting a fair shake. When you're in a crisis, no one's going to be necessarily praising you for the way you responded. There's an expectation that you're going to, as a responsible uh, company, corporate social responsibility, if you will, corporate goodwill, that there's a, there's a, a type of behavior that's expected, the, 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 the bar, you know, the, the, the initial thing you, things that you do, the, the actions you take. And so from there, you have to make sure that you, uh, before you even get messages out, that you take the right actions or are planning to do so very quickly. And of course, we talked about that earlier today. It's not just what you say, it's what you're doing. Uh, in the case of the uh, ferry disaster today, they were very good about not just speaking, but they said, hey, we're going to help the families get to there. That was very thoughtful and a good example of that. So. But uh, one, one last thing from your book I wanted to touch on, and th thank you for that, that stuff. Uh, you talk about messaging, very important, and uh, I think you use the acronym CUBE. Uh, I think C was for consistent. I didn't get through all of it, so maybe you could pick it up from there. Well, now you're really testing my memory here. Okay, okay. so good no, job. I have it. It's okay. I, I, if I can't do this, I have to write it apart. <laughs> so here we go. C is for consistent. If you change your message I'll every time... Yeah, I'm sorry. He is for consistent, and the importance of, of consistency is it takes numerous repetitions of a message for it to stick and be remembered, to move somebody in your audience from unawareness of an issue to awareness of the issue to the action you want them to take. So if your message changes slightly every time you give it, guess what? You don't have a chance for it to stick. And, and by that I mean if your website is saying one thing and your media interviews are saying another and your speeches are saying another and your pamphlets say another, guess what? You're never going to have a consistent message that ends up being remembered by the public. U is for unburdened, and uh, I'm going to shortcut the unburdened one yeah. because it talks about a lot of things like jargon. Uh, the most important thing, and, and the authors of the, the great book Made to Stick really made this point more brilliantly than I, I could in the one page of the book. I covered this, uh, this topic, but the importance of a message being concrete and not general. Abstract messages can't be remembered. Concrete messages can be. So to the degree you can be really in the weeds and giving great details, people will remember the big picture if you give them the small picture. They can't understand what the small picture is from the 35,000 foot level. So you is for unburdened by abstractions. Uh, okay, the B in cube A is for brief. The average media soundbite on the evening news, if you are uh, watching, let's say, Brian Williams or Diane Sawyer, the average soundbite today is 7.3 seconds. So wow. that translates to about 18 words in a soundbite. Can you be effective in 18 words? Well, Johnny Cochran sure was when he talked about uh, if it doesn't fit, you must quit. I think that's what, eight words. So <laughs> if you devise the right media soundbite, yes, you can be effective in, in 18 words or less. It takes work. It's not easy to do, but it, it sure is worth the time investment to do it, especially in soundbite journalism where they're just not going to give you the time. Uh, e is for earworthy. I'm just going to, Rich, if I could, I'm just going to read this example out of the book. I was going to, yeah, I was looking oh, at it. Oh, yeah, go for okay, it. No, you, I don't, no, feel free. Go ahead. Okay, so I give an example. I changed it a little bit to protect the confidentiality of one of our clients, but this was a line that they had in a speech. This multilateral agreement and its steady progress forward is critical 
because it will protect Americans who could otherwise be maimed or killed should they consume, knowingly or unknowingly, unapproved imported meats, unpasteurized dairy products, or dangerous unregulated alcoholic beverage. Oh, my God. That is the... That is not exactly how we speak in everyday communication. And what I make the case to do is to sound like a human, sound like you normally do. So here's the rewrite of that statement. We need to sign this agreement quickly to protect Americans from dangerous meats, dairy products, and alcoholic beverages. Yes. Oh, okay, I get that. So right for the ear, not for the eye. I go into detail in the book about the right way to do that. And then the final thing in this Cube A, five-step thing to good messages, is, uh, okay, so the first four steps were all about how you can write good messages. Step five is, but there's an audience out there, and you need to make sure the message is aligned to their needs and to their concerns. So take a look at the messages that you've written down, the three things, perhaps, that you think are the most important things you want the public to know, and then write a separate list of what the audience wants or needs from you, and make sure that those themes are reflected in your messages. If they're not, themes like, uh, helping to save them time, money, helping their work-life balance, helping their health, helping them protect their family. If those types of themes about what the audience wants from you aren't reflected in your messages, the final step is to incorporate that. Make sure you're, you're talking about your topics in their way, not your topics in your own way. Great point. And I would just add to that that uh, know, know your audience in terms of the difference between an audience watching CNBC versus an audience watching Fox News or CNN or MSNBC, just if we look at the, the big the cable broadcasters. Uh, so if you're talking about business on CNBC, there's going to be a level of sophistication about investments and financial, tech, uh, financial uh, vocabulary uh, as opposed to a more general audience you're going to find on CNN and, C, uh, and, uh, and Fox and MSNBC. So know your audience and also do your research uh, before an interview, whether it's people like myself or Brad or your in-house uh, public relations person. What I always do when someone, uh, a client says I have an interview with so-and-so, uh, if I'm not physically there and I'm, maybe I'm traveling, I'll say find, call them back, find out, uh, find out the deadline first of all, find out what they're writing about, find out um, so they get their name, get their uh, their title, get their uh, cell number, get all the contact information, and then say, uh, "Can I call you back?" Uh, you make a great point in the book, Brad, and I. I and we're actually saying the same thing in a different way. You talk about the pause, you know, and then say repeat. So think about your question. Uh, think about the question. Think about what, how you're going to answer it, and pause and think about it before answering. And I say also, when you get that phone call, and this happens to companies all the time, they get a call from the media. There's no media relations policy, and suddenly you have a secretary putting a call through to an executive who does the interview on the phone. I'm sure you've heard this too. Uh, and then uh, it gets dangerous, and it gets it's a slippery slope. So you could always take a few minutes to gather your thoughts, gather your information, and call that reporter back. Just never hide from them and make sure you get back to them. Uh, and it's also very important to let the people in your office know what that media relations policy is. So it should, and it, it should be short. You know, if a call comes in, it should go to this department or this should go to this executive and should be handled there. Uh, yes. And the point, one point I make in the book is make sure you communicate that to every temp that ever staffs your phones too. You have a new person coming in for the week to cover for somebody. Right make point. sure they know that policy because that temp has your entire organization's reputation in their hands. If something happens and he or she, whoever's behind the reception desk, picks up the phone from a reporter and says, yeah, I think this is what's happening behind me, that's on the record, and your entire company is now out there with uh, communicating something you may not have wanted to. So training your staff on how to deal with incoming calls is never a one-time thing, and make sure you remember the, the temps and the security people whose temptation most of the time is to do that, put their <laughs> hands in front of the camera. Get me there. <laughs> yeah, great point. Great point. And, and, and on that note, we'll, we'll start to wrap up. Uh, I think uh, we, we covered a lot of ground, and I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, I know our viewers are going to learn from this. Again, the book is the uh, – let me see if I can get this straight here in the camera. Uh, this is so difficult, the technology. Okay, the, the Media Training Bible by Brad Phillips. Uh, available on Amazon, on Kindle. Is it available on iPad too? Yeah, iPad, Kindle, and if your viewers want to check out a few free sample lessons before buying, they can go to mrmediatraining.com slash book, oh. uh, and we have five or six sample lessons up there. They can sample it. If they like it, then they can make a decision. 
Excellent point. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, for those of you watching, our website is www.thecrisisshow.com. If there's anything you heard tonight or today, wherever you are in the world, uh, if there's anything you heard that you liked or disagreed with or agreed with, feel free to tweet about it using the hashtag, using hashtag The Crisis Show. Uh, that's hashtag The Crisis Show. Uh, we're, we'll be back next week. A lot to talk about. Uh, Brad's website is uh, Brad. Your your main website is the MrMediaTraining.com. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a good website to send people to MrMediaTraining.com. Great. And of course, Brad is a as a as an avid tweeter. He's uh, look for him on Twitter at MrMediaTraining. That's right. Uh, and he's a real giver in the business. Not everybody is. He gives a lot of good information out almost every day, uh, and really gets you to think about these important subjects of media training and communicating with the media in this new world. So with that, Brad, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we'll do it again. Absolutely. I'd love to have you back. And good luck with the book. And uh, we'll talk soon. Uh, Thanks to you and your viewers, Rich. Appreciate you having me here. My pleasure. Again, uh, thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll see you next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time for another uh, edition of The Crisis Show. Rich Klein signing off. Thanks again, Brad. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.